Mountain County. What is your emergency? Yes, I'm just on a shooting, please. Okay, do you know of anybody's been shot? Yes, I see the lady. I see in her garage right now. Is somebody shot? Yes. Okay, what's your name? Jessica. Jessica, 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 and her husband, Darren, heard a gunshot from across the street. As she got up to look out the window, she heard a scream. Looking out, she could see one of her neighbors fall to the ground before a second gunshot was heard. This neighbor was Farah Frada, who had just returned home from a hair appointment moments before this incident. When Laura realized Farah wasn't getting up, she dialed 911 and gave a detailed play-by-play -play of everything that she saw. Okay. There's, a, there's, a, there's a black man. Is he black? I don't want to say he's black. He's dressed in black. Okay, there's still a person out there. There's a black gentleman. He's wearing a black shirt and a black pants. A lady is down in her garage. She's been shot two times or two shots. Oh, dear. Okay. Police arrived on the scene and quickly secured the area. And when Farrell got out of the car, uh, a, a man came through the side uh, garage door there and, and shot her one time. And they heard the shot, saw her go down, and then... He stepped out and he stepped back and shot her one more time while she was laying on the pavement. A car pulled up right up here on the street. And there was, at that time, there was a bush at the end of this garage. The man, they saw the man run in from behind the bush and get in the car. Shortly after this crime took place, a neighbor called Farrah's parents to inform them that their daughter had been shot twice. After rushing to their daughter's home, they were met with police lights, yellow tape, and an officer trying to prevent them from seeing Farrah. After somehow getting by the officers, they were able to see her. Farah was still alive and convulsing. It wasn't long before she succumbed to her injuries and was pronounced dead. Her eyes were still open, so her mother laid her hand over her eyes and shut them. The first words out of her mother's mouth were, Where is that son of a bitch? In the beginning, uh, what was funny was I, I wasn't very attracted to her physically but she was just uh she treated me wonderfully i felt that as she was coming over to my apartment and as she'd want to cook for me clean for me do my clothes for me i'm like this woman's wonderful so I, I kept praying to god saying is this the woman that you want me to marry this is robert frada ex-missouri city police officer and firefighter turned bodybuilder robert was always admired by his friends in the gym he was known to be very methodical and meticulous in the way that he sculpted his body through diet and workout regimen. However, for somebody who was borderline obsessed with having the controlled lifestyle of a bodybuilder, there were other aspects of his life that were not compatible with it. At the time of Farrah's murder, Robert was going through a so-called messy divorce with her and was sharing custody of their three children, Bradley, age 7, Daniel, age 6, and Amber, age 4. It was a Wednesday night which meant it was Robert's weekly Wednesday night visitation with the kids. Instead of the usual plan of taking them out for dinner, he took them to church. Robert took them back to Farrah's home afterwards, only to arrive at a crime scene. Despite his reasonable alibi, police immediately suspected Robert to be involved in the murder of his ex-wife due to the nature of their divorce. Robert was then taken to the Harris County Sheriff's Office for an interview. Have you ever been a suspect in any kind of crime? Yeah, the uh, last time she, you know, had a stunt like this, uh, yeah, I guess it's on file with y'all. Um, I think they titled it a uh, uh, robbery. And then talk to me about that. When did that happen? Mm. Uh, I guess it's been like six months now. What happened? Well, I never really got the straight story. Um, According to my children, uh, somebody came in the house, bypassing the alarm system and everything else, did nothing, but, and, I mean, according to Farah, what she told detectives was that he said that he was there to, quote, this is what they said to me, get, have my ass in a sling. Yet, I'm listening to the phone book. You know, I mean, I'm easy to get to, so I don't know. What month did that happen? I honestly don't remember. It, it'll be on file with you, although just, uh, you know, if you punch in the address. The 
incident that Robert is describing, in which he was suspected of being involved, was months before Farah was gunned down. Farah's children woke up to the screams of their mother. She had awoken to a masked man towering over her with a stun gun. The kids pounded on the other side of her locked bedroom door as she was attacked, begging the intruder to let their mother go. The suspect fled the scene and was never caught, although she told authorities that she believed Robert had something to do with it. No proof was ever found of his involvement. trial like towards the end of the month that's why I'm trying to get all my tapes and everything in order now and I mean I'm missing some real important ones I'm missing an assault tape she tried to file assault oh that's something else too she tried to file assault on me and the cop listened to it and realized that hey you assaulted she assaulted me you know so it was totally the other way around and she tried to file charges on me so like I said she's just kind of strange that way she's pulled several stunts and like I said to me um, I mean, I'm finding weird stuff. Um, oil is being drained out of my Jeep. I mean, just stupid little things kept on happening to me over and over again. And, uh, and like I said, I just kind of sat there and sleep with my gun by my bed and everything else. And I mean, you can ask any of my girlfriends, the way I sleep is ridiculous because I honestly felt that she was trying to pull something on me. So the one day I was working my 24-hour shift, a buddy of mine went into my house to take a shower and he heard people in my house that opened the door and boogied out and left. Now, you know, and plus, I was missing a bottle of wine out of that stupid ordeal, too. Is any force that's right? No. So I'm missing several keys. So whoever is coming in is just waltzing right in. So whoever came in can, can come in, came in through my garage. I also had a nail, like, here in the doorway to that one door that's gone. So I know that somebody came in. The only things I'm missing, all right, that bottle of wine the one time when somebody came in when my buddy was there, um, the tapes. My diary, which, it, which my diary was strictly for the uh, divorce. It was strictly divorce diary. I don't keep diaries. And the check, like I said, that was just a random check that you know, made out to me. So I have no idea, you know. Uh, was the no, check ever cashed? No, it was <clears throat> a bad check. Did you ever file a report? No, I, I just found all this out relatively recently. I still don't understand why somebody would come in your house. You and me both. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. If they had that much access to you, they'd just kill you. You, you're right. You're 100% right. Yeah. And, and that's what I've been saying to my friends, too. It's like, somebody's f***ing with me, but not trying to kill me. Robert just spent the last nine minutes of this interview laying out a multitude of reasons for his frustration, paranoia, and suspicion regarding his wife. His wife, whose murder he is currently suspected of being involved in. If Farah is responsible for all of the mayhem that he's been dealing with, it only paints a more vivid picture of all of the reasons why Robert would feel the need to murder his ex-wife. Finally, the detective cuts off Robert's tangents to ask some more mundane personal questions. Uh, let me put it this way. When my buddy Where'd went into my school? house, it, it, there were no cars there. Where'd you go to high school? New York. What's the name of the high school? W.T. Clark. Where is that at? It's West Marine on that What year did you graduate? 75. Was that in college? Yeah, Nassau College in New York also. Did you originally have your wife killed? No, I did not. I'll put it this way too. I mean, if anything happens to her, that's one of the things I was thinking about on the way over here is like, what the hell am I going to do now? I mean, me battling for custody was also relying on her to be paying me child support at six or seven hundred dollars a month. Okay, but it's important to point out that even though these six to seven hundred dollar monthly payments may seem significant, Robert was still the beneficiary of Farah's life insurance policy. Robert would try to collect nearly two hundred thousand dollars from Farah's life insurance in the months following her murder. You may have noticed that the last time the detective left the room. Robert had multiple fidgeting habits, including picking at his hands and rubbing his eyes. Rubbing your eyes can be therapeutic. 
Compressing your eyes stimulates the vagus nerve, which decreases your heart rate, thus relieving stress. What you're about to see is Robert taking that concept to another level with an eye rubbing technique that can only be described as frantic and explosive. <laughs> This is in stark contrast to his behavior while the detective is in the room. With very few expectations, Robert leans forward for the entirety of the interrogation, with a surprisingly calm and focused poise. Who are your friends? I don't think the only, I guess, character reference you can get would be Rick Rando. Do you have a phone number? Uh, 361. Nobody on the friends? I know the people I work with, Steve and Is he also a firefighter? Yeah. Uh, he's just a firefighter. Robert's lack of close friends is more understandable once you consider that he was actually diagnosed with narcissism and an antisocial personality disorder. Symptoms of antisocial personality disorder include hostility, agitation, aggression, or violence. There is often a lack of empathy for others and a lack of remorse after harming others. The relationships of people who suffer from these disorders are naturally more susceptible to abusive dynamics. This was apparent to the people who were close to Robert and Farah before the divorce. Apparently, Robert had always been extremely controlling of Farah's lifestyle and appearance, to the extent of recommending and financing physical enhancement surgeries. Robert also had some abnormal sexual practices, such as coprophilia which is the interest and pleasure in feces and defecation as a source of sexual arousal. Psychologists say that practices like this can be another telltale sign of a certain control in a relationship as a result of pressuring your partner into a degrading and indignifying act. When you picked up your son at what time? Or your daughter, I'm sorry, Amber. Amber was uh, before five and the boys were about five. So she was probably about 4.45. My mother-in-law could probably tell you the time. What did you do with that? Uh, from there, we went to... Um, I think to my house. I got changed into this because I was wearing my gym clothes. Um, then went to Wyatt's to eat. And then from Wyatt's went to St. Mary's Church. What would you do there? A, um, you know, parent-child uh, type of uh, uh, process for the sacrament of, uh, you know, going through confession and stuff. Bradley did his class and then, you know, he does the children's class and the adults do our class and then we meet up for like 15 minutes after that. Unfortunately for Robert, he would miss out on most of the class he was supposed to partake in excusing himself multiple times throughout the night to speak on the phone. What was she asking for for child support? Hmm. Um, she asked for, uh, when, when she first filed, you have to, like she filed for divorce and I never realized she was going to go through with it, so I agreed to pay 600 Um. She then filed for an increase of, I believe, 300 more which we just went to court for about six months ago, and uh, but the judge only granted her $36 extra. Why does she want a divorce? I guess to sum it up, basically, uh, there was no romance and affection in our marriage. It was more like, um, I mean, I loved her, I provided for her, you know, took care of her and everything, but we, I guess we just weren't in love with each other, you know, and whereas to me, I was able to handle it and kind of, I guess just told her, look, you know, cope with it, what's the big deal, you know, we don't have the best marriage, but it's far from the worst, she wanted to find somebody to put her on a pedestal and file for divorce. Who did the doctor at the hospital tell you about your wife's condition? That it, it wasn't good, that she had a pulse and, I think he said she had a pulse and was breathing, but it, you know, wasn't good. He didn't know if she was going to be a possible vegetable or anything like that. He just didn't know at this time. And that's why uh, 
I want to take the children down to see her because my father died when I was young and I regretted not being able to at least be there for that. So I'll think about letting, letting the boys at least talk to her um, and just keep Amber out. If she dies, how are you going to feel about that? I feel sad. I mean, like I said, I do still have feelings for her. Um, I never, you know, would have wanted anything like this to happen. I mean, I, you know, I, I still, for some reason, I feel like she knew the person for some reason. Do you um, think you, you had a fair chance of um, getting custody of your children? Yeah, yeah, I did. And I think she knew it. Basically, I, I mean, I was a good husband. I didn't do anything wrong to warrant this. And it's only because of her selfishness that she broke up the family. And yeah, and I felt pretty good about that. After 14 hours of questioning, Robert was released from the sheriff's office and was immediately bombarded by cameras and microphones. Despite his ex-wife being murdered and accusing the sheriff's deputies of violating his civil rights, Robert is surprisingly cool-headed and charismatic while talking to the media. We're not allowed to make uh, any calls. I mean, I thought they might have had a tape somewhere in the room. I kept saying into the tape what time it was, and I, w I want to call an attorney. Um, I was, like I said, I was completely denied all that. Like I said, I was beaten, and you know, this was ridiculous. When I first got there, I initially thought it was a drug raid. Everybody looked calm. Nobody was frantic about anything. Um, I saw everything taped off, and I thought I saw Farah. I, I still don't know who it was that I saw, but I thought it was far standing there. I was going to actually walk up to her and joke, oh, what, do you got a drug raid going on here? He knows how it goes. He's well aware of his rights. He well, he's well aware of what we can and cannot do. He knows how to make problems. And he, uh, you know, he's just been real amused by this whole thing. Police had no choice but to let Robert go, since they lacked enough evidence to continue detaining him. On March 1st, 1995, about four months into Farah's murder investigation, a seemingly unrelated bank robbery took place at a local bank in Houston, Texas. The suspect fled on foot, leaving a literal paper trail as packets of cash fell out of his bag. The suspect was quickly apprehended, and inside his bag, police found the thousands of dollars of cash that he had stolen, as well as multiple guns. Police looked into the federal records for these weapons, and to their surprise, one of them was purchased by a familiar name, Robert Frada. The bank robbery was attempted by a man named Howard Guidry. Investigators quickly made more connections linking Howard to Robert. They discovered that Howard was actually a next-door neighbor to somebody named Mary Gipp. This name also appeared on Robert's phone record multiple times on the night of the murder. Mary's contact information could also be found in the address book in Robert's car on the same night. Mary Gipp and her boyfriend, Joseph Prystash, would often go to the same gym as Robert. Investigators had questioned Mary after seeing her name on Robert's phone records. However, she refused to fully cooperate with police and ultimately remained closed off when speaking to any authorities. Fortunately, Police hit the lottery with the arrest of Howard, who quickly recognized that the odds were against him. He decided to fully cooperate, and on March 8, 1995, Howard submit a written confession to the murder of Farrah Frada. That same night, Howard agreed to give the detectives a walkthrough of the crime scene. Whenever I killed the girl, Colin, and he'll be waiting by this phone, and, uh, <coughs> That's basically it for, for here, but uh, he called Bob, and uh, Bob was at church with his children. Where'd you get the pistol from? From Howard. Joe. I got the pistol from Joe. Maybe uh, maybe 30 minutes before we got here, back at the apartments, Joe gave me the gun. Okay. Howard, just like before, I'd like for to, to read this to you and tell me that you understand everything. You have the right to remain silent and not make any statement at all, that any statement you make may be used against you and probably will be used against you at your trial. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Any statement you make may be used evidence against you in court. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. You have the right to have a lawyer present to advise you prior to and during any questioning. You understand that? Yes, sir. In this footage, Howard is being read his Miranda rights, and he seems to clearly understand and agree to everything that's being said. However, keep in mind that no lawyer was present. 
This footage, along with the written confession, eventually led to the conviction of Howard Guidry on March 1, 1997. Howard's appellate attorneys promptly filed an appeal. Howard's attorneys argued that on the night of the confession and walkthrough, Howard had requested an attorney earlier that evening, and so the detectives left his side to make the call. Upon returning, they told Howard that they spoke to said attorney and said the attorney stated that Howard could openly speak to the investigators. However, Howard's attorneys claimed that that phone conversation never took place. In other words, Howard invoked his right to counsel, and the police detectives violated that right by continuing to provoke Howard's confession. It was then determined that Howard's confession was therefore inadmissible in court. In Howard's first trial, the prosecution's case heavily focused around Mary Gipp's testimony. This testimony was found by the state courts to be hearsay. However, any information that could be perceived as hearsay was deemed harmless due to Howard's full confession. Once Howard's confession was deemed as inadmissible, Mary's statements were no longer admissible as well. In other words, the two main pieces of evidence that led to Howard's conviction were now nullified. This resulted in Howard's murder conviction being temporarily overturned, and Howard was granted a retrial in 2007. This time, the prosecution's case relied on three pieces of evidence. The testimony from Mary that avoided hearsay, Howard's possession of Robert's gun, and the ballistics evidence. The second jury found Howard Guidry guilty yet again. Although they weren't fully successful, Howard's attorneys capitalized on the apparent missteps of the authorities and delayed their defendant's sentencing. This isn't the only time that this happens in this case, but we'll get to that later. The pieces began falling into place for investigators. In his confession, Howard described the man who hired him to kill Farah, but it wasn't Robert. It was Joseph Prystash, Mary Gipps' boyfriend. Investigators now felt that they had a plausible scenario for how Farah's murder was carried out. Robert hired Joseph as a middleman, who hired Howard as the hitman. This information gave police enough leverage to convince Mary to cooperate with them. Within hours of being subpoenaed, she made a deal. She would give them any information she had in exchange for immunity. They now had two out of four people fully confessing their involvement in Farah's murder, both with matching stories. From there, they were able to arrest Joseph Prystash, who also confessed to being the middleman and getaway driver in exchange for a couple thousand dollars and Robert's Jeep. After a long five months of gathering enough evidence to build a case, authorities arrested and charged Robert Frada for soliciting two hitmen to kill his wife. During the trial, the prosecution revealed that Frada had repeatedly expressed his desire to see his wife dead after their divorce, telling one of his friends, I'll just kill her. I'll do my time, and when I get out, I'll have my kids. Witnesses even testified that Robert had solicited as many as seven people to carry out his wife's murder. Additionally, while Robert's alibi of being at church with his children was solid, it was swiftly dismantled. As mentioned earlier, other churchgoers saw Robert spend a lot of time on the phone. Paired with the phone records, it was clear to the jury why Robert was glued to his phone that evening to stay updated with the people murdering his wife. On May 3, 1996, Robert Frada was sentenced to death for the murder of Farah Frada. I cannot wait for the day when I see him laying on that table waiting to get the injection. That will be justice for me. I know for myself he's gone. Farah's parents would go on to raise the kids, changing their last name from Frada in order to break the ties and move on. However, this wasn't exactly the end of Robert's story. Even though Frada was first sentenced to death in 1996, over a decade later, he was allowed a retrial. His conviction was overturned by a federal judge, who ruled that confessions from his co-conspirators shouldn't have been admitted into evidence. Howard and Joseph's confessions were used against Frada without allowing him an opportunity to confront and cross-examine them. This meant that Frada's constitutional rights of confrontation were technically violated. In the same ruling, the judge wrote that trial evidence showed Frada to be egotistical, misogynistic, and vile, with a callous desire to kill his wife. Robert's 2009 retrial ended with the same result as the first. For the second time, he was sentenced to death for Farah's murder and returned to the Allen B. Polinsky unit in Livingston, Texas, where death row inmates are held. We, the jury, find the defendant Robin Allen Frada guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment signed by the foreman. Does either side wish to have the jury poll? Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time,
once again. Even though unsuccessful, the defense basically reset the clock on Robert's death sentence through an appeal. One of the most controversial aspects of death row in the United States is the unfathomable amount of time spent waiting for your sentence to be carried out. The conditions in which prisoners are held on death row can be comparable to that of solitary confinement. For some, this reality is much worse than capital punishment itself. Studies have proven that prolonged time on death row has a significant effect on the psyche. There is a wide array of responses the human mind may have in order to cope with this traumatic experience. One common response to such trauma is a newfound appreciation for religion. Over the next 14 years waiting for his capital punishment, Robert would form a strong relationship with his religion, having dreams that he claimed were revelations from God. It was Jesus' voice talking to me about contacting the Mormon church and he gave me information about them. It coincided with previous, uh, what I'm, I firmly believe are revelations of God to, for me to write about a new government system and forming a new country. I did, I followed the instructions of the dream. I contacted the Mormon church. They sent me their Book of Mormon and everything that I read matched the information that was given to me in the dream. Oh no, not at all. I'm, are you kidding? I pray to God every night to take me in my sleep. I, I, I'm not afraid of death. In a last-ditch effort to delay his execution, Robert's lawyers argued that prosecutors withheld evidence that a trial witness had been hypnotized by investigators. They believed this led her to change her initial recollection of the crime. This appeal was denied, as the hypnosis in question produced no new information and no new identification. Regardless of this practice being widely regarded as a pseudoscience, Robert was also one of four inmates involved in a lawsuit aimed to stop the state's prison system from using what they allege are expired and unsafe execution drugs. This appeal was also denied just hours before Robert's scheduled execution. On January 10th, 2023, at 65 years old, Robert Frada was asked if he had any final statements before a lethal injection was administered. All he said was, no. He was then injected with a lethal dose of pentobarbital at the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. The witnesses on the victim's side of the execution chamber included Farah's son, Bradley Bakur, Farah's brother, Zane Bakur, a friend, Judy Cox, and Andy Cahan, director of Harris County Crime Stoppers Victims Services. The only witness who sat on Robert's side of the execution chamber was his spiritual advisor, Barry Brown, who prayed for him in his final moments. 24 minutes after the injection was administered, he was pronounced dead. Robert Frada became the first person in the state of Texas to be executed in 2023. Howard Guidry and Joseph Prystash continue awaiting capital punishment in the Allen B. Polinsky Unit in Livingston, Texas. Good evening, I'm Kim Ogg, Harris County District Attorney. The death penalty is reserved for the worst in America. It is the government and society's highest punishment for the worst crimes. Robert Frada had his wife murdered to settle a divorce, something that millions of Americans go through. It was a premeditated crime. It involved two other people, a middleman and a shooter, and the victim, Far Frada's life was negotiated down to a thousand dollars and a car. For this, she was murdered. Robert and Farah had three children. One of them was here tonight. Frada never apologized. There was no question about his guilt. Two separate juries tried him convicted him and sentenced to death, and tonight justice was had.